I wanted to start with the question because this is the rare opportunity because you also have a podcast and quite a popular one. And I find it interesting that most marketing podcasts tend to do short form, very tactical stuff. But you, you have also chosen a longer format interview style for your podcasts. Um, was that deliberate? And what values, what value do you think that gave you um, to explore different ideas and maybe what cons are associated with that long form as well? Yeah, it's funny. It was not deliberate. It's because I'm very long winded and I, I like getting into in depth discussions with people. I have a very hard time doing like surface level, quick question, okay, move on, quick question, move on. I struggle with that style a lot. Like I want to ask the follow up. So I want to get the details. I want to get every little thing from the person I'm talking to about their tactic. And I think a lot of it has to do with SEO as well, right? It's like, very hard to just surface level talk about a strategy or a campaign that was done or a technique or how Googlebot crawls the website or something like that. So that's, it wasn't a conscious choice. Or it's not like I sat down and I was like, oh, what's going to make the best podcast? Let me just do long form because I think that's going to get the most downloads or whatever. It was really like what suits the content format or suits the topic and my style the best, right? Um, so no, it was not a conscious decision at all, but I think it's worked out because a lot of other SEO podcasts are that more short for, form style, which I don't really like for that kind of topic. And I think it has helped set my podcast apart a little bit. Uh, it's hard though to keep up a long form show, right? As I'm sure you've experienced as well at times. So I think it can, if it can be done and done well, it's definitely a competitive advantage for sure. Yeah, it feels so as a, as a listener, I, I think there's like horses for courses. I think that's an English saying, right? Uh, different yeah. things for different people. Um, I like long form. I like to put it on in the background as I'm driving or commuting or doing my dishes or whatever. I think some people may prefer the tactic, the short, short form stuff. But yeah. as a listener, I realized I'm like, well, this is what I like listening to. So that's why we chose that. And I think mm -hmm. similar to you, I like rambling and I like going on tangents. And sometimes yeah. maybe you've noticed this. I think that a conversation is going to go a certain direction. And yeah. then through the course of a long form, you end up being surprised by what you learn. Something comes up that you never could have planned for. So I, I find that's right. to be true uh, as well about that form. Yeah, you have to give things space to, to, to find. Sometimes you need to find your footing with a certain person as well. Like there's people I've had on my show where like we instantly connect. Like I never talked to them before. And there's an instant rapport there, right? Like So Carrie Jones, she's somebody that comes to mind. I interviewed her years ago about a... a a link PR strategy thing they did over at Fractal. And like her and I, we did two episodes together. We hit it off right away, but there's other people, Bill Slosky, for example, well-known in the SEO space for looking at Google patents. I interviewed him twice, but the first hour with him was tricky because he and I have very different talking pace and timing. And he thinks very like deliberately. So he doesn't answer things right away. So, um, it takes a little while to find your conversational pace with people. And so that's another good reason for long form, right? Because if, yeah, if we cut something off artificially at 30 minutes, you might miss a really, really important point. That would Every time I do these interviews, I swear like the, the last 10 minutes, I'm like, man, this is the topic I wanted to spend the next two hours on, but we're already there. So right. even in a long form conversation, I still find that to be true. So I can't imagine a 20 minute conversation like, hey, let's get to it right now. Do you, right. do you send questions to the guests before they come on or how do you prep them for something like this? I usually don't send questions. I like to find that balance between having a natural conversation, but also it depends on the guest. So I've had some guests where literally they've never spoken. They've never been on a podcast. It's literally their first time in front of people. And I'd like to give people that kind of first shot at things, especially when they're a really good practitioner, but they just haven't talked about what they do a whole lot. And I love finding those certain people. Um, but so for them, I know they need a little bit more preparation or just feeling ready or an encouragement. So I might do a prep call with some people, mm. like on a rare occasion, where we actually talk through what they want to talk about. I try not to give questions. I try to just give bullets of talking points and even just keep those broad. Because I find that if people, the weird thing that happens is, when people know what's coming, they'll like just start answering your question before you asked it. And then it throws off the entire flow of everything. And then I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay. So they answer that. Should I still like sort of ask this? You're like, what do you do? Right. So then it just throws off the pace of things. So I usually just try like bullet points. Um, mm. at the 
follows. Yeah. How about you? Uh, we don't send over talking points. So I'll usually do something like, Hey, we'll probably talk about, you know, agency growth with you. We'll probably talk about SEO. I think some of the topics we, we kind of know we'll cover, but I, I probably cater toward, like, I probably under index on preparation and that may be a fault, but I find that, um, it allows for more spontaneous and sometimes honest answers. Um, one thing I learned, so I took an improv class, uh, four or five years ago. It was one of the scariest things I've, I've done. Yep. And um, I, it made me realize how often I and almost everybody plans their answers in their head or like their kind of what they want to say. Even as you're listening to somebody in the course of a normal conversation, you're often thinking about like, oh, what am I going to say to this? But in yep. improv, that was like the biggest fault line uh, mm-hmm. because they would do exercises where essentially um, the sequencing would change so rapidly that if you plan to say something 10 seconds ago, that old. plan was over it, by the time it got to your turn. So it yep. kind of taught you to be more in the moment and more honest. And you know, those were the funniest things you said were when you were just kind of blurting out what was directly kind of in front of you. Yes. So I, I tend to under-index on it. Um, but I, I worry sometimes that people, especially who haven't done podcasts before, um, you know, maybe that's intimidating to them. Yeah, I think it is intimidating to a lot of people. But if so, one skill as you as a host, right, is learning to, to meet somebody where they're at. So like I've had a few guests on my show where I know I could my job is to get out of their way because they're so good. Like I could say one thing and they're off and running and they could talk and it's interesting for like a half an hour, right? But there's some guests where you need to like pull them along with you a little bit. And that's where um, it might be more intimidating for them. But if you are a good host where you understand the people that need a little bit of pulling and encouragement versus those that don't, then you can you can make up for any gaps and where they're intimidated, basically. So I do think it's intimidating, but I think if if you can pull it off well and make the guests feel comfortable, I th- still think that's a better show than the one that's totally planned out. Totally agree. So do you have any um, lessons learned, secrets, tips in terms of like pulling those lessons out of people who may be, you know, less comfortable freewheeling, um, especially a practitioner? Because I love that idea of finding people who's it's it's their first time talking in front of a crowd because there's so much insight uh, buried in, in those people as practitioners, frontline people. How do you how do you make them feel comfortable and draw those lessons out? So, okay. Those are two different things. So how I get the lessons out is I state something that I know they're going to disagree with. I love that. Yeah. So it's like, if I ask you, oh, tell me about how this thing works or whatever, like that might not be as motivating or like inspiring for you as a guest. But if I'm like, yeah, I don't really think Google operates that way. Like I think they do X, Y, and Z, and I know they're going to have a contrary point, then they're going to want to like debate that with me. Right. So I love that. Bringing somebody into a debate is a very powerful way of doing that. All of the best interviewers do that very skillfully, but the danger is making sure you don't that they don't feel insulted by that, right? That it's a healthy, hey, just playing de- devil's advocate here, right? Like, so what if this and this? So you have to do it in a way where they don't feel like you're just putting them on the spot, right? Making people feel comfortable, I find, is a lot more to do with my demeanor, body language, tone of voice, uh, being on video. I encourage all my guests to like turn their video on and like say hi and like so we can see each other. Um, yeah, so I think uh, comfortable is very much like my demeanor, but getting people to say things is like healthy debating is a good thing too. I love that. Yeah. Have you experimented with different formats? Like, have you done live in-person podcasts versus video versus no video? Yeah. Um, I used to record all my podcast episodes as if they were live. I even like punched in the intro music would like record everything live because that really sped up my production process when I was doing that. Well, then COVID hit, I dismantled my recording setup here at my office and like it got all messed up. Um, but I've even recorded a live episode live on stage at tech SEO boost, um, a couple of years ago, again, during live events. And that was a panel, right? So that was interesting. So I prepped an hour of questions about analytics for a whole panel. And, um, that was weird. That was definitely, uh, threw me off of my normal comfort zone and flow quite a bit. Um, I haven't done a whole lot where there's a lot of editing I've done a little bit like that done a little bit of some experimental episodes. Like I did an episode years ago, actually about conversion Excel called Mm. email. And um, 
they had a problem with their website, with their Google rankings at the time. They lost the Google rankings. And I did this thing where I, I like in my consulting work for CXL, I realized they were getting penalized because they had big headshot pictures in the sidebar mm, right. promoting courses that had nothing to do with the blog post that you were currently on, right? So um, basically, anyways, I created this 15-minute podcast episode where I recorded the sound of thunder outside my office, where I recorded sound effects. And I told more of a first person, you know, single person soliloquy, essentially like a story. And that became a podcast episode, but I did it more like, uh, like you'd hear on a storytelling podcast or something. Right. So there's been a few like little experimental episodes like that here or there, but the production time is really intensive for stuff like that. Right. Maybe you've experienced that too. I don't know if you do your own editing or you have people do that sort of thing, but uh, the guys from Radio Lab, they always say, like, anytime you introduce editing to a podcast, you can triple the amount of time it's going to take you to produce that podcast. Minimum, bare minimum. Right. Yeah. So we, we deliberately avoided that because of that reason. Right. Like, we, the way the podcast works for us is it's basically, the minimum viable effort on my part yeah. um, in terms of like, I almost just get in front of the microphone and talk, it, whether we're doing like a kitchen side episode, which is like me and the co-founders talking behind the scenes about different strategies and, and kind of how we think about problems in content marketing or in interviews like this. And then it just goes off. Um, our content growth marketer um, handles all of the paperwork and coordination with our editor. Uh, we've got the the theme song done for us. We've got the artwork done for us. Everything's basically distributed and automated and I don't see most of it, but that's, that's like the opposite of what you do. Right. I I think I listened to a a podcast interview where you were talking about how you do all of the mixing, all of the editing, all of the recording, all of that stuff. I do. Yeah. It's like almost entirely me at this point. So um, when we had an employee, he would do at least the page on the website and show notes and stuff like that. Then we, we, we downgraded. I don't have an employee any longer, but my wife usually does that stuff. And it's probably why I have barely done any episodes this entire year because client work has been so busy, you know, and if I'm the person that literally produces a hundred percent of my podcast, then if I'm not available to do it, that's what happens. Right. But yeah, I do. So I'm also a musician, right? So I do all the audio production, um, you know, editing, I get pretty crazy and, and, nerd out a lot about like EQ and compression and all the audio stuff. Right. So um, it takes me probably a little longer than it should. Cause I, I sort of have a lot of fun with that, but I, I really want to make all my guests in the show sound really good. And I've gotten a lot of comments from people that, you know, have said to me, like, you've got some of the best audio quality we've heard on like an SEO podcast. I mean, even now I'll go listen to some of the new SEO podcasts that come out and I have to cringe right at some of the audio that I'm hearing just cause it's so it's like quiet or there's stuff in the background or, you know, so I take a lot of pride in the audio editing for sure, but it does take a lot of time. So. I mean, it's important though. I've, I've heard, and I guess I can also resonate as a viewer if this is more so for video, but like on YouTube, if you want to invest your money in something, it should be quality microphones and quality audio equipment because yep. people will forgive poor image quality and video quality, but they won't forgive poor audio quality. That's and right. I find that to be true. 